Hi, uh, everybody, and welcome to today's edition of the Spectral Geometry in the Cloud seminar. Uh, today, we have uh, Maxime Fortibourg, who will uh, talk to us about linear programming bounds for hyperbolic surfaces. As usual, if you have questions during the talk, don't hesitate to either uh, just unmute yourself and ask a question or to type the question in chat and we'll relate to the speaker. Maxime, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jean, and thank you to Laura and Alexandre for the invitation. Um, so yeah, so everything I'm going to talk about today uh, is joint work with Bram Petri, um, and it's it's in a new preprint uh, with the same title uh, posted on the archive uh, two weeks ago. So the the objects that uh, we're interested in are closed hyperbolic surfaces, uh, so surfaces with with constant curvature equal to minus one. Uh, and G is going to denote the genus of these surfaces, which is going to be an integer bigger than or equal to two. Uh, and it's not, not a Riemannian metric, sorry for <laughs> our Riemannian geometers in the audience. Um, and so the moduli space of these surfaces are, are such uh, surfaces up to orientation preserving isometries. And this is a, a nice uh, space. Um, it's, it's a six G minus six, dimensional orbifold. So there are some cone points uh, in this space uh, due to, to surfaces having more symmetries than, than others. Uh, and there are you know, explicit local coordinates for, for the space, uh, for example, given by Finchel-Nielsen coordinates. So if we take a maximal collection of uh, simple closed curves disjoint uh, from each other on the surface, then we can uh, attribute the lengths of these curves uh, arbitrarily, uh, and then also we need to specify twists by which these curves are, are glued, or each side is glued to, to each other. Um, and this space uh, is, is non-compact, but the, the, we understand the, the non-compactness, so the only ways to fly off to infinity is to pinch some collection of curves on these surfaces. Um, and just one slight remark is that if for a closed hyperbolic surface, the area is fixed equal to uh, four pi times the genus minus one by the Gauss-Bonnet formula. Uh, so in, for many problems, uh, one usually wants to do some normalization uh, and this, this is already done by asking the curvature to be equal to minus one. Okay, and now for hyperbolic surfaces, we're interested in various invariants defined on these surfaces. And then there's sort of two dual points of view. Uh, so if I think uh, uh, of my surface as, as the universe, then uh, uh, you know, uh, a ray of light, uh, I can think of it as a particle, uh, which is going to move along GD6 on the surface. So from the classical mechanics point of view, we have GD6 and the interesting ones are gonna be closed GD6 and they, there's numbers associated to these. Uh, given by the periods of these closed GD6 or the lengths, uh, their lengths. And then from the quantum mechanics point of view, we can think of light as a, as a wave. Uh, and then, uh, so it's gonna be an uh, eigenfunction of the Laplacian on, on the surface. And then the numerical value associated to this is the corresponding eigenvalue of the Laplacian. And so from, from uh, these numbers, we can construct just the, the set, the collection of, of all uh, lengths of closed GD6 is called the length spectrum. And then the collection of all eigenvalues of the Laplacian is, is going to be the eigen spectrum. Um, and then on, on both sides, we can talk about multiplicity of each entry in this spectrum and the spectra are taken with multiplicity. So we record how many closed GD6 have the same given length and how many, well, the dimension of each eigenspace on the right-hand side. Um, and then, so I'm gonna uh, focus in particular on the first entries that appear in both spectrum. So of course, uh, from the eigenspectrum side, uh, the because we have uh, compact uh, surfaces uh, and connected, then the eigenvalue zero is always an eigenvalue. Um, corresponding to constant functions, and it's a simple eigenvalue. And so the first interesting one is the first positive eigenvalue. And then on the classical mechanics side, the shortest closed length of the shortest closed GD6 is called the systole. Uh, and then the multiplicity of, of these, these things are called the kissing number and the M1 respectively. 
Um, and then there's various other um, invariants that one could look at. For instance, it makes sense to talk about counting functions on both sides. So how many uh, entries you see in a given interval. Uh, and then uh, when you study the asymptotics of that, then uh, you get the prime geodesic theorem on the left-hand side. And, and then there's Weyl's law on the right-hand side. Uh, but I, I'm not going to talk about these things today. I, I want, I'm going to be focusing on, um, on ground states, so on, on small uh, lengths and small eigenvalues. Uh, so instead, I'm going to look at the, the number of eigenvalues in a fixed interval uh, and a, a very specific interval. So we say that an eigenvalue is small if it belongs to the interval from zero to a quarter. And the reason for a quarter is because it's the bottom of the spectrum of the Laplacian on the hyperbolic plane. And somehow, so eigenvalues that are less than a quarter are bad uh, uh, for some reasons. Uh, so for instance, they, they introduce error terms in the prime geodesic theorem. And if, if you don't have small eigenvalues, then sort of dynamics of the geodesic flow on the surface uh, mixes faster, things are nicer. Um, Okay, so the, the number of small eigenvalues by definition is, is going to be the number of eigenvalues in the interval zero to a quarter counted with multiplicity. Um, so we're interested in this invariant and maybe a side remark is that the, the corresponding thing in my mind for uh, classical mechanics is the number of primitive closed GD6 of length at most two arcs inch of one. And I'll say uh, in a little bit why I think this is the analogous quantity. But uh, on the other hand, everything is known about this, this number on the left-hand side. That's why I put it in gray. I'm not really going to talk about it much. Um, so yes, yeah, so these are the invariants. And then the questions are, how large can these invariants get in any given genus? Uh, what are the maximal possible values for these invariants? And there's very few answers known. Uh, so uh, in, for the systole and the kissing number, the only uh, maximal value, value known is in genus two, and they're both achieved by the Bolza surface, uh, which is can be obtained uh, by gluing opposite sides of this regular uh, octagon here with interior angles uh, pi over four. Um, and then uh, in genus three, we know the maximal value of the multiplicity, uh, which is equal to eight, and that's achieved by the Klein quartic. Um, and that's a result, uh, again, joint with, with Petri, which I talked about in this seminar uh, a year ago. Um, and both of these surfaces also happen to, to be the surfaces with the largest number of symmetries in their respective genera. And then for the last invariant, I introduced the number of small eigenvalues. So there's a, a theorem of Attal and Rosas uh, that says that that's always at most 2g minus 2. Um, and there was an older construction of Boozer uh, that said that uh, this value 2g minus 2 can be achieved. So if you have a, uh, a hyperbolic surface with a short pants decomposition, so if you take a maximal collection of disjoint simple closed curves, uh, then these cut out the surface into spheres with three holes, and these are called pairs of pants. And then if, if the cuffs of these pairs of pants are short enough, uh, then you can show that uh, you're going to have 2g minus 2 small eigenvalues. In fact, in addition to being between 0 and, and a quarter, you can, in fact, arrange that they're all smaller than epsilon for any uh, positive epsilon. Um, so so this, this value is achieved in every genus by, by any surface with the short enough pence decomposition. And then the, for the analogous quantity for, for closed GD6, uh, I said that the number of, of closed GD6 of length at most two arcs inch of one. Uh, so um, there's something called the color lemma that says that uh, such GD6 uh, happen to be disjoint from each other automatically. Uh, and therefore, there's at most, the, the best you can have is a pants decomposition. And the number of curves in the pants decomposition is 3G minus 3. So the color lemma is, is, is due to uh, Linda Keen, but the, the precise value of the constant two arcs inch of one was computed by Boozer. Um, so that's why I'm saying there's not much more to say about this, this, but 
I, I think it's so the 2g minus 2 really corresponds to the number of pants that you have in the uh, in the pent decomposition. The number of complementary components is 2g minus 2, and the number of curves is 3g minus 3. Okay. Um, so, I mean, how do we um, fix the problem that we don't have, uh, that we don't know many maximizers? Well, how do we find new maximizers? One strategy is to try to prove new upper bounds uh, for these invariants and hope that our upper bounds are good enough and, and match uh, examples. And so uh, the question becomes, what are the best possible upper bounds we can prove for these invariants? And that's the content of the new paper with Bram, uh, where we prove new upper bounds on all of, of these uh, five invariants. Uh, so here I'm showing you a, a collection of different plots, one plot for each invariant. And on each plot, there's a, a few different things. So in red is the previous best uh, known bound. And then in blue are the new upper bounds. So you can see that the, the new upper bounds are better than the previous ones. Uh, uh, in, in all genera, uh, except for a few exceptions. Um, and then the last thing on, on the, the plots um, are the green uh, jagged curves. And these represent the best known examples for the maximization of these invariants. So the, the surfaces where these invariants are as large as, as we know. Uh, but I should point out that there's, uh, there's little data that has been uh, gathered uh, so far on these invariants. Um, and uh, I think we, we these curves are going to be brought upwards in future years, hopefully, as we gather more and more data. Uh, for instance, for the first eigenvalue lambda 1, uh, it's only been computed numerically for a few surfaces in, uh, in by Joseph Cook in his PhD thesis. Uh, it's been computed for some surfaces in genus 2, 3, and 4, but that's it. And then the other points that you see on, on this plot are just lower bounds on lambda one that we obtain some that indirectly. That, so we don't really compute the, the first eigenvalue, but uh, we have indirect means of proving lower bounds on lambda one. And this is what this plot represents. Okay, I'm gonna just add more decorations to the plot. So as I said, there's a, a few, um, Examples where previous bounds were were better. So, for example, in genus two on the left hand side, uh, we our bounds don't quite manage to to prove that the Bolzer surface uh, is optimal for the system and kissing number, but it's not too far either. But yeah, the the red curve is below the blue curve uh, in genus two there, um, and then uh, there's also for lambda one. There's uh, like four different. Uh, three different points in genus two, three, four, and six, uh, the red curve is below the blue curve. Um, and uh, also, so the way to see the, the, the Klein quartic in genus three maximal for M1 is just the fact that the blue curve and the, the green curve touch in a single point. So our previous paper represents this single point in that fourth plot. Um, so the other thing I, I want to mention is, is the, the previous best upper bound on lambda one. And so here, notice on the, the vertical axis, some of these are not just the value itself, but it's been renormalized in some way. So for lambda one, we subtract the quarter and multiply by the log of the genus squared um, because you know, the upper bounds converge to, to a quarter. And then it's hard to sort of see if, if we leave it just as lambda one, things get squeezed down. So that's why we blew them up to see better. Uh, but yeah, so th this there's a recent preprint by Kravchuk, Mazak, and Powell from 2021, in which they obtain new upper bounds on lambda one uh, using something called the conformal bootstrap. And they, they got really good bounds on this, uh, at least in genus two and three, the upper bounds they found are really, really close to the numerical values computed for the Bolzo surface and the coin quartic. And so that's, they, it's been conjectured that these surfaces are, are maximizers for lambda one and genus two and three. Um, so that the curves do, the red and green curve do seem to touch, but um, that's not known yet. Um, and then, so when we saw that their bounds were very, very good in 
these genera, we got worried a little bit, but when we, we did the calculations uh, and pushed the numerics further, we saw that our bounds uh, eventually get better if the genus is large enough. Uh, maybe one last thing to comment is, is the last plot. So there's more curves on the multiplicity plot. So in pink, there's a, the curve that corresponds to Alain de Verdier's conjecture from the 80s. Uh, that uh, that among all Riemannian metrics on the closed surface of genus T, not just hyperbolic ones, that the multiplicity is bounded by a constant times the square root of the genus, um, and this is this is widely open, and uh, also in in yellow or orange were the previous best constructions due to to Colbois and Colin de Verdier uh, in general, uh, and uh, so. In genus three, we we um, you know the Klein quartic did better than than this construction, uh, and the proof of that used representation theory, and by just applying this to to other surfaces that have a, a large number of symmetries, we were able to 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 raise the green curve up in certain genera, uh, and improve on these examples. But you see that the new green curve still stays below. Uh, uh, Colin de Verdiesk pink conjecture. Are there any questions about the plots or any questions so far? Yeah. So there, there's one last invariant uh, that I talked about, which is the number of small eigenvalues. And I said that by Otan Rosas, uh, this is by, bounded by 2g minus 2. So it's natural to just divide by 2g minus 2 to get a normalized constant. And then that's bounded by 1 uh, everywhere. But now the what I've told you is that this is sharp if you have a short pen's decomposition. But now, what if you assume that the systole is, is growing, that the systole is large enough? Can you prove, improve bounds on this number of small eigenvalues? And the answer is yes. And that was done by Huber in the 70s, uh, where he has this, this decreasing curve on the right-hand side uh, in red. And then we were able to improve upon this as well with the blue curve. Um, so of course, before two point something, uh, Atal and Rosas is is the best you can get, and then uh, after that, our our bound becomes better. Uh, but the what I think is more uh, a more interesting consequence of this is that uh, if if the number of small eigenvalues is strictly less than two, uh, meaning that it's equal to one, uh, and and corresponding to the trivial eigenvalue zero. Uh, what that means is that there's no other eigenvalues in the other interval zero to a quarter, which means that lambda one is strictly larger than a quarter. So if you can prove that the number of small eigenvalues is strictly less than two, then that proves you a lower bound on lambda one. And uh, you know because of the plot on the left hand side, you, you see that if the systol is large enough, then there's some hope to prove that the the number of small eigenvalues is less than two, and um, we're Indeed, able to get, to to get this, and we get a criterion saying that if the systole is large enough, then lambda one is going to be larger than a quarter, and that's um, you know that's a natural question to to ask, uh, and it's related to a conjecture of of Selberg that the the spectral gap of uh, principal congruence covers of the modular curve uh, have spectral gap at least a quarter or equal to a quarter because they have a continuous spectrum above a quarter. Uh, but then it's natural to ask whether uh, in every genus for closed surfaces, whether there always exist surfaces with spectral gap at least a quarter. Uh, and then as a result of our, our bounds, uh, we know that that's true in genus two to seven and 14 and 17. So these are represented by the green curve being above the blue curve. So the bounds, the criterion is represented by the blue curve wherever the systole uh, or the green curve gets, gets above the blue one, uh, then the spectral gap is larger than a quarter. And like I said before, there's very, there's too little data uh, gathered so far. I would think that the green curve stays above the blue curve, at least in, in every genus smaller than 20, that there's just too few examples of surfaces where the systole has been computed. Uh, however, in large enough genus, I don't think that's going to be true anymore. I think I, I don't think that the green curve will always stay above the blue curve, but I still think that the that the 
answer to the question should be yes, that there always exist surfaces with spectral gap larger than a quarter. And one big reason for this is that a recent result of Hyde and McGee says that that's almost true. So for every epsilon positive in a large enough genus, there exists closed surfaces with spectral gap at least a quarter minus epsilon. So that's, um, that's it for the results. And so now I, I'm eventually going to explain where these bounds come from. And the truth is that they are computer assisted, uh, all of these blue curves. Uh, so, so I think that's, that's nice to be able to use the computer to, to prove theorems. Uh, but unfortunately, you sort of, uh, you don't, don't get understanding from, from that. And then uh, there's the next natural question is, okay, if we have these bounds in low genus, what do we get in high genus? So how do we extrapolate from the bounds in low genus? Uh, so how do we extrapolate in higher genus? And I think we successfully managed to, to do this to sort of outsmart the computer uh, and, and deduce something in large genus. So that's a very heavy slide, sorry about this. But uh, so we do get asymptotic bounds as the genus tends to infinity for all of the five invariants I discussed so far. Uh, so I just indicated on the right here, the comparison with the previous best upper bounds it doesn't exactly, it doesn't matter much uh, what the details are. But so for instance, let me just go back to the plots. Uh, so for the systole from the plot, it seems apparent that the blue curve always stays a bounded height below the red curve. And then we thought, you know, we have to prove this and we eventually did. Uh, so numerically, it seems like the, the blue curve is, is 0.3 below the red curve. And then we managed to prove it's, it's at least 0.27 below the red curve. Uh, so it's an additive improvement upon the previous best upper bound due to Bavar. Uh, maybe just, so for the kissing number, uh, there was a previous bound by Parlier, also of the form genus squared divided by log t. Um, and then in the previous paper, we had already improved uh, is, is constant by a factor of three or something, and we were you know, proud of ourselves. But then we further decreased this constant by a factor of roughly 24 this time. So we beat our own record uh, by using better functions. Uh, okay, and then for, for lambda one, the, the, again, there's a, the question is how close to a quarter you get, and then we get an improvement by a factor of four there. And then for the multiplicity, we improve an additive amount of four, which is, again, very far from uh, Colin de Verdier's conjecture, but it's better than nothing. Uh, and then for the last one, for n small, um, our upper bound is, is actually is, is an improvement, but it's still asymptotic to the upper bound due to Huber from the 70s. Uh, and his methods are very close to the methods we, we use as well. Um, and somehow it seems to me that, that uh, some of the theorems we prove in this paper could have been proved many, many years ago. Uh, uh, like Huber was sort of on the right track. He could have proved theorem 8.3 if he wanted. <laughs> Uh, is what I'm claiming. Any questions on this? All right, so I said that I would, I will now move on to, to discussing proofs and the, the strategy of how we prove these bounds. And it's all motivated or inspired by uh, results in sphere packings. So there's this very beautiful paper by Henry Cohn and Noam Elkies, uh, published in the Annals of Mathematics in 2003 in which they obtain new upper bounds for the density of sphere packings. So here in Euclidean sphere packings, so we're just looking at collections of balls of equal radius in Euclidean space that are uh, that have disjoint interiors. And the question is, so the density of such a sphere packing is just the proportion of space that the packing uh, uh, fills. Uh, and the, the goal is to, to find the best possible upper bounds or the packings that, that um, fill space most efficiently. And then they, they found a new way to prove upper bounds uh, for the density. And they, they obtained the plot that you see on the right-hand side. So it's very similar to the plots that I've showed you, uh, where the upper curve is the previous best upper bound, the next curve is their bound, and then below the jagged curve is the best known examples. And then what they immediately saw is that the curves seem to touch in dimensions eight and 24. 
and then they conjectured that their method could be used to prove that the, the packing coming from the E8 lattice in dimension eight and the leech lattice in dimension 24, uh, that their method could be used to prove the optimality of these packings. And this is exactly what was done by Marina Piazowska in 2016 uh, for the E8 lattice. And then a few weeks later, her and co-authors uh, generalized the, the method to work in dimension 24 as well. And that's that's what she, a big part of what she was awarded the Fields Medal last summer for. Okay, so I'm not gonna tell you in detail um, how they obtain these bounds and so on, but the, the main thing to know is that the, the tool, the main tool they use is the Poisson summation formula. And if you're a spectral geometer, then you know that one interpretation for the Poisson summation formula is to say that it relates the length spectrum of a flat torus with the eigenspectrum of the Laplacian. Uh, and then, you know, since we're interested in hyperbolic surfaces, well, there's also a similar gadget for, for such surfaces, and it's called the Selberg trace formula. So let me go over what, what this says. So here we need to fix some convention for the Fourier transform. So here I have this, uh, I use a one over a square root of two pi factor and no pi's in the exponential inside the integral. Um, and then we uh, need to, to have a definition of what's an admissible function. So by definition, it's an even integrable function such that the Fourier transform is defined and holomorphic in some strip uh, containing i over two and minus i over two. Uh, and also that the, the Fourier transform decays fast enough uh, horizontally as you move in this strip. So it decays faster than one over z squared. Uh, so some, some high power higher than two. Uh, and then uh, need some more definitions. Of, just a reminder, the eigenvalues are labeled lambda j's uh, listed again with multiplicity. Uh, and then C of M is gonna denote the closed oriented GUD6 in the manifold, meaning that the, each curve is counted, appears twice with both each orientation. And then L of gamma is the length of gamma and lambda of gamma is the primitive length. And I realize I, I talked about primitive closed GUD6 earlier and I didn't say what that means, but a, a curve is primitive if it's not running over itself more than once. And so if, if you have a, any curve, its primitive length is the length of the, the unique primitive curve such that our, that gamma is a, a power uh, of, of the primitive, well, the, yeah, is a power of this primitive curve. And then the primitive length is the length of that primitive curve alpha. Okay, so with all these definitions, the Selberg trace formula says that for any closed hyperbolic surface of genus G, and for any admissible function f, then we have this equation which relates the eigenspectrum of the Laplacian on one side with the length spectrum of the function on the other side. Uh, so <laughs> it doesn't matter much exactly what the equation is, uh, but it's written like this. And I mean, there's, sort of, there's three terms there. We have the spectral side, which is a sum over all eigenvalues. Then there's some left alone term uh, that we call the integral term. And then there's a, a sum for over the, the closed GD6 uh, in the manifold. And um, so I mean, th this, this is a, a very nice formula. And for example, you can use it to, to prove that the eigenspectrum and the, the length spectrum determine each other. So if, if using multiplicity. So for instance, the, the one way to see this from the trace formula is to, to take test functions f such that it localizes at the, at the single point and, and its mirror image across zero. Uh, so if you take f to localize at a single value, if you assume that you know the, the eigenspectrum, then uh, you know on the right-hand side, by taking a limit to, to delta functions, you can de determine whether there's a term corresponding to a given value x uh, because you know the left-hand side of the formula. Uh, and then you can also recover the multiplicity there and, and vice versa. So if you take test functions f such that f hat localizes at the single point, but f is going to then spread out. But still, if we know all the length uh, 
lengths of closed GD6 and their multiplicity, then we can compute the right-hand side, which means that we can determine whether a given point X is in the eigenspectrum on the left-hand side and compute its multiplicity as well. So that's a theorem of Huber, uh, which follows from the trace formula. Okay, so now I want to really go uh, more in the details of how we use the trace formula to prove to prove bounds. And I'm going to focus specifically on bounds for lambda 1 uh, because things are, are slightly simpler. Uh, I mean, the strategy is, is similar for all the T invariants, but there's uh, some subtleties uh, depending on, on each invariant. And somehow lambda 1 is, is, turns out to be the simplest in the end. Okay, so for each of the invariants, what we have is a criterion that says, suppose that you have a test function that satisfies certain uh, inequalities, then from it, you can deduce an upper bound for the invariant. So here's the specific form for lambda one. It says, suppose that uh, for any genus, fixed genus G, uh, suppose that you have an admissible function <coughs> for which there exists some L positive such that F itself is bigger than or equal to zero for all X, uh, for all real X. And then we want the Fourier transform to be eventually negative. So uh, negative past square root of L minus a quarter, well, non-positive rather than negative. And then lastly, we want that F hat at I over two is strictly less than the integral term. If we have this, then lambda one of any closed hyperbolic surface of genus G is going to be strictly less than L. So we prove an upper bound on lambda one if we can find a test function like this. And the proof is very straightforward. So it's by contradiction. Suppose you have a, a surface M such that lambda one is at least L. Uh, then uh, if we have this, then that means you know, lambda one is at least well L and lambda J is at least L also for every J bigger than or equal to one. And by hypothesis, F hat of the square root of that eigenvalue minus a quarter is gonna be less than or equal to zero for all J bigger than or equal to one. So if I look at the some on the spectral side, all terms are going to be non-positive except for the for the zero term for the lambda zero eigenvalue. Uh, and when you put lambda zero eigenvalue in this, you get the square root of minus a quarter, which is i over two. And here, I mean, the, of course, you take the square root of a of a negative number. There's some ambiguity. There's two square roots a priori. But since we take our function f to be even, f hat is also even, and it doesn't matter which square root you choose. But yeah, so since all terms are non-positive, uh, this is less than or equal than the value at i over two. And then by hypothesis, this is less than the integral term. And then certainly we can also add all the geometric terms because by hypothesis, f is, is bigger than or equal to zero everywhere. So each term in the geometric sum is larger than or equal to zero. And then by the Selberg trace formula, this thing is equal to what we started with, the left-hand side. And this is a contradiction because we had that the, we proved that the sum over, I can, the spectral term is strictly less than itself. So that's a contradiction, which proves that lambda one is at most L. So the goal now, we've transformed the geometric problem of you know, computing or proving bounds on lambda one into a purely uh, Fourier analytic uh, extreme old problem or optimization problem where we just want to look at functions f such that it and its Fourier transform satisfy certain inequalities. Uh, and then what we want to do is get the best upper bound from this, the best possible L. So we want to minimize the last sign change of f hat uh, under these hypotheses. And so one thing maybe I should point out is that because of the first hypothesis that f is bigger than or equal to zero everywhere. Uh, so the Fourier transform on the imaginary axis is just going to be up to a constant that the integral of f times cosh of, of t uh, at it. Uh, and uh, so that's going to, to be positive and in fact increasing along the, the imaginary axis. So the, the first hypothesis, hypothesis implies that f hat uh, is is positive along the imaginary axis and in particular at the origin, unless the function was constant equal to zero, uh, which is already ruled out by the third bullet point. But yeah, so 
the point is f hat at the origin is positive and then we ask it to be eventually non-positive so it means it's it's going to cross the x-axis somewhere it's going to have a zero and the last uh the last simple zero it, it has is represented by this l and we want to minimize this last simple zero okay <clears throat> so that's the goal um and so how do we do this well the, the strategy we use for proving bounds using computers is uh, completely borrowed from the, the strategy that Cohn and Elkies uh, did for sphere packing. So the strategy is to look at specific types of test functions, namely polynomials times Gaussian. So if you have a polynomial in X squared times a Gaussian, then the Fourier transform of that is gonna have the same form. And moreover, uh, the, the map that computes that goes from the first polynomial to the second polynomial is a, is a linear map and it's easy to compute. Uh, if you take in the basis of Laguerre polynomials, then this map is, is you know, it, it, it's a diagonal map with eigenvalues plus or minus one. Um, so you just, the idea is just to ex express P in terms of Laguerre polynomials and then just flip some of the half of the coefficients of this to obtain Q. So now uh, why, What's the advantage of doing this? Well, the advantage is that we, we don't need to compute the Fourier transform. It's computed uh, very quickly, automatically. Uh, and then we can also hope to, to use this form to, to, uh, to make sure that the hypotheses are satisfied or to hope that the hypotheses are satisfied. So for instance, we want the, the, um, some integral inequality to be satisfied, the inequality labeled two here. Uh, so now we can, sort of just force this inequality to be satisfied by setting, asking the left-hand side to be equal to say 0.999 times the right-hand side. Uh, and technically what we do is just, we compute the integrals for each Laguerre polynomial numerically. And then, so the, the integral for F hat will be the combination, linear combination of these integrals. And so we can just set a linear equation uh, to be satisfied. Uh, and then we also want to impose some double zeros on the polynomials P and Q to try to prevent sign changes for, from these functions. So recall that we need F to be bigger than or equal to zero. So maybe if we put some double zeros in a bunch of places, it's gonna prevent F uh, to, to change sign to become negative. And same thing for, for F hat, we want it eventually to stop changing sign. So we want it to stay negative and sometimes putting double zeros can, can help this to be true. So to pick a, a, some places where you want double zeros and then asking these conditions to be satisfied for P and Q is, gives you a linear system of equations. And then you, you can solve for the coefficients of P and Q uh, given this system of equation, just a linear system. Uh, but so of course the, you find a solution, but maybe the, the, the conditions are not satisfied. You're still going to get a function that, that's not positive everywhere. But if, if, you, if you're lucky, then it works. You find one, at least one test function that works. And when that happens, what you do is just, you wiggle the zeros and then try to optimize to reduce the L that we obtained from this function f. And that's what we do. So the sort of the, the tricky part is maybe finding a good set of zeros to start with. And once you find one, you let the, the optimizer do its thing. And then the, the, it, it usually converges to what seems to be some optimal function f. Uh, you know, we start with some number of zeros and then we add more zeros to, to uh, make the functions more precise. And then the the upper bounds seem to decrease as, as we increase the number of zeros. And so here's a plot of just one example of a pair of functions, f. Uh, so this function f is, stays bigger than or equal to zero. There's some imposed double zero here near three, and then there's maybe other double zeros further down the line. And then you see f hat has a simple zero near two, and then it's gonna have double zeros after that point. And then so it, this function satisfies the the conditions and it gives you some upper bound on, on lambda one. This is uh, the, the, the function that we get in genus two, the, the optimal pair of function that we get after running our algorithm. Okay, and now in the <clears throat> time remaining, I want to explain uh, 
So this is what, what we do for the computer proofs for the pro plots. And then how do we extrapolate from this? How do we outsmart the computer uh, in higher genus? Uh, and here's the strategy. It's a, a very simple scaling trick. So instead of trying to find a new function for each genus, we're gonna just try to find a single function that works in all genera. But uh, we like the genus needs to be involved somewhere. And the idea is just to, we're gonna take a fixed function, but we're gonna scale uh, it in the domain uh, depending on, on the genus. So find a single function F not with the following properties. So we want it to be uh, non-negative everywhere on the real line. We want it to be admissible, uh, of course, so we, it's even integrable and the Fourier transform decays fast enough. Uh, and then, so we just want to normalize in the, by, by scaling so that we're gonna fix the, the last sign change to be at one, okay? So the location of, of the last sign change is fixed to be at one. Uh, and then the, the function is required to be non-positive after that. And then for the for the problem, what we do is we take uh, we want f hat to be such that f hat of x is just f not hat at r x. So we just scale in the domain as I was saying, and where we choose the scaling factor r depending on the genus. Um, and then so for that to be true by just by the scaling property of the Fourier transform, the function that we need to use is f not at x over r divided by by r. And that's uh, if f not was non-negative to start with, then this scaling is also going to be non-negative. And the other thing to notice is that the, the last sign, sign change for f hat is going to be at one over r rather than at one. And so that the upper bound that we're gonna obtain from this is gonna be, is gonna be related to one over r. Uh, and now, so what do we need to do? How do we choose the, the capital R? Uh, we need to choose it in such a way that the inequality is satisfied. So we want uh, f hat at i over 2 to be strictly less than the integral term. But f hat at i over 2 is f not hat at r i over 2. And the size of that is then related to, you know, to the growth or to, to the asymptotics of f hat not, f not hat along the imaginary axis. And then on the right-hand side, if we try to compute the, the integral term, corresponding integral term, uh, we can write it in terms of f not itself. Uh, and then by a change of variable, uh, we can sort of ex express this as the last integral I, I have there. Uh, and then this integral on the right-hand side, what you notice is that, so in absolute value, tanch is bounded by one. And if I, if I remove the tench, then the integral I have left here is a convergent integral because my hypothesis was that f not hat was decreasing at least like one over y squared plus epsilon. Uh, so this is convergent, and and therefore this this term is 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 bounded is big O of one over r squared. So it's quite it's small if r is large. Whereas on the left hand side we have uh, the Fourier transform uh, at r. I over two, so it's it's you're going along the imaginary axis, and then uh, it's not hard to see that if um, if f not is uh, sorry if f is positive in the neighborhood of a point a, then the this thing is going by the expression I had before that the Fourier transform is the integral of cosh times the function. Uh, it gives you that this thing is going to grow exponentially, at least exponentially. Uh, if if it's positive, the function f is positive somewhere, and more so by Paley Wiener, if the support of f not is minus a a, then the then the f not hat is going to be of exponential type a, so it's going to grow at most like e to the a t times a constant. Um, and now recall that our goal was to prove an upper bound uh, on L, uh, which is related to the one over r here, the last sign change. And so the goal is to minimize this. So the goal is to maximize R. So you want to maximize R such that this inequality is satisfied. Uh, but the right-hand side is, is very small and the left-hand side is growing exponentially. So what we want is to, to minimize A. We want to minimize the, the support of the function F naught and therefore minimize the exponential type of the function on the left. So that's gonna help us make R as large as possible. So now, uh, now 
we have a very sort of concrete uh, extremal problem in terms of, of Fourier analysis. Uh, and it's part of a sort of whole industry of, of problems called uh, uh, signed uncertainty principles. So these kinds of conditions where uh, we have a positive uh, function that's bigger than or equal to zero, and then we want the some signed condition on, on its Fourier transform. These kinds of problems have been studied before. And it turns out that the, so by Gorbachev, Ivanov, and Tikhonov, uh, they, they studied a various, uh, a large collection of problems in this vein, uh, which extends uh, earlier problems studied by, uh, by Logan. Um, any, anyway, the, the upshot is that the best function to use for this particular problem is the function that's written there, f not here, and the, the support is minus 2 pi to 2 pi, the, the smallest you can make the support. Uh, so so I, I'm lying a little bit, or I forgot to say something, is that to make sure that the left-hand side is strictly less than the right-hand side, we at least need to make sure that the right-hand side is positive. Otherwise, there's no hope because the left-hand side is positive. And for the right-hand side to be positive, a, a necessary condition is that the second moment of f not hat has to be non-negative. And then uh, on assuming, given these conditions, uh, the extremal function is, is the one that's written there. And, and here I've drawn the plots of, so on the left is the plot of, in red, the plot of F naught, and on the right hand side is the plot of its Fourier transform in red. And in uh, the, the other, the colored plots in blue and, and green represents the optimal functions that we found using the other scheme, using the, the Gaussians times polynomials. Uh, so if you take these functions that we obtained through the computer and then rescale so that the last sign change of the Fourier transform happens at one, uh, then you get these plots. And so you see that that the functions we find do seem to converge to this asymptotically optimal function f f naught. So and this is just up to genus twenty, which is should be in some sense far from convergence still, but uh, we see that we're yeah it seems to converge. Okay, and then once once you know this is the function that you want to use, then uh, to figure out what bound you get from it, uh, we just need to to estimate the left hand side, which was f not hat at i r over two, and then to to estimate this, we just need to to know the growth, the asymptotics of this function on the imaginary axis, and here we have an explicit formula. This sign on the imaginary axis is just cinch essentially. Uh, which, which grows like the exponential. So the ex asymptotic is given by this. Uh, and then we also need to understand um, how the integral behaves to, to, to have some estimate for the integral and then just solve uh, for R such that the in inequality is satisfied. So we need to know the asymptotics of the integral. Uh, and to do that, so the problem is that if you look at this function, its second moment turns out to be equal to zero. And so that's not enough to guarantee that the, the integral on the right-hand side was going to be positive eventually. Uh, so if you, if you look at the limit that's there, if you put an R cubed in front, what you get is zero. And then from this, you can't deduce anything. Uh, and so what we had to do is to, to push one degree, one order further, uh, to, to find the right uh, right rate of decay of this thing. And uh, if you put R4, uh, we can't compute the, the, the limit. It's given by the integral on the right-hand side, and then we can estimate this numerically, check that it gives something like 4.207. Doesn't matter. The important part is that it gives you a positive limit, which means that if you look at the integral on the left-hand side, if you forget the R to the power of four, that that's eventually positive uh, if R is large enough. So ultimately, this is a, a consequence of the dominated convergence theorem. But the, the, the problem is, is if you try to apply dominated convergence theorem directly, uh, it doesn't work because the functions themselves are not bounded by an integrable function. So you have to, to do some fiddling with the integral, express it slightly differently uh, to be able to apply uh, the dominated convergence theorem. But anyway, this this I thought this was a hard limit to compute. It, it takes three and a half pages of calculations. Uh, but uh, if you're interested, one, one 
baby step is to first check that the function has a zero second moment, which is equivalent to saying that the integral of the function there is equal to zero. And there's uh, more than one way to prove this, but uh, yeah, I'll leave it to you as an exercise. Uh, and then I, I see that I'm going over time, but the conclusion from this estimates, you can solve for R, and then the conclusion is that R, you can take R equals to this quantity, log G minus one plus log of a constant divided by pi. And when you put this back into the, the original thing, it gives you the R asymptotic bound, a quarter plus the fraction there squared. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Maxim, for the, for the talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. So if you have them, don't hesitate to uh, ask them now. Um, I think I'll, I'll get the ball rolling. So, so it is somewhat clear that uh, you, you've really optimized your method right now using uh, uh, um, this, uh, this, uh, uh, these bounds for the, for the best uh, function <coughs> bytes, kind of, and all, uh, and the two other people, and um, you, you, in a way, you're, you're still quite far from the. the the colin Vazir conjecture, for example. Uh, so, it, <clears throat> yeah, it, so it, this, it, is, this is for lambda one, but for M1, things are, are trickier. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happens is that we, using linear programming, what we get is upper bounds when lambda one is, is fairly large. So when it's above a quarter, then we're mm -hmm. able to obtain good bounds and in fact, sublinear bounds in the genus. Uh, mm -hmm. But the problem is our bounds blow up as as lambda one approach a quarter, and so the we have to use different methods below, well near a quarter and below a quarter, and eventually we fall back onto the the results of Sevenek, which which gives you this two g plus mm -hmm. plus three, but the like the only reason we we're able to to reduce three to minus one is that uh, is proof involves different sort of topological topological cases. And then some mm -hmm. of these cases can be ruled out uh, if you're not mm -hmm. too far above a quarter. So that's where we get the subtraction. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, the so, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, it's not gonna help to try to, to optimize this approach for M1 uh, mm -hmm. for, because it doesn't work at all uh, below a quarter. So something has to be done differently mm -hmm. or when lambda one is below a quarter. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, thanks for, for this. Do we have other questions for? Uh, I have a question. So uh, yeah. you, do you hear me? Okay. Yes, 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 we hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, it's about your test functions with uh, uh, exp exponential minus x square time a polynomial. Yes. So of course they satisfy the, the assumption which you ask for a Zellberg transformula, but they are match. The Fourier transform is uh, decaying in a the, any bound. They came way too fast. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, did you try to, to get the example of, of function which are much better, so which are just decaying in, in some bound uh, between uh, one half plus epsilon? Okay, because, because maybe the, the test function you are using are not uh, optimal in general. Yeah, yeah, they might not be in the sort of right class of functions to use. Yeah. And um, and we've tried to think about this and, and Bram kept insisting and, and, and repeating this point that we, we should try to use different functions. Yeah. Uh, but I, I guess we haven't found a good class of, of yeah. functions to use where uh, F, yeah, we, we want functions um, that decay just polynomially uh, essentially. Yeah. So one over X to, to some power instead. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. The, 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 the quick answer is I don't know. The, mm -hmm. uh, so what you want is something where, where it's easy to compute the, the, yeah. the Fourier transform sort of automatically. Uh, and then also that you have some way of testing or certifying that, mm -hmm. that, uh, there's no sign changes. So mm -hmm. here 
the fact that we're we're playing with polynomials. So basically, we could have polynomials times anything, and uh -huh. that that's that's sort of positive and decaying fast enough that would uh -huh. work as long as uh, uh, you can find a nice basis of su such functions. So the, yeah. the places where we use the fact that they're polynomials is that we can use this to certify that the functions don't have uh, extra sign changes yeah, by yeah. using yeah, terms uh, theorem to count the zeros okay. of the okay. Okay. So, but so yeah, that's need, a very good question. You need, you need to have explicit Fourier transform. Otherwise, you cannot test what True. happens at infinity. And, uh, that's, yes, uh, exactly. So your uh, polynomial is... Uh, it's uh, against functions of the uh, harmonic oscillator, something like that you are using. No? You, your polynomial times uh, your basis is just uh, from uh, harmonic oscillators. No? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what that is. Sorry. <laughs> no, you look at the uh, operator, which is minus dx over dx, d2x over dx squared plus x squared. Okay. It's okay. called harmonic oscillator. And it uh, commutes with Fourier transform. It means that you have exactly what you said. You call that Lager polynomial. I don't know what the name of polynomial, but, yeah. but, uh, but it commutes with uh, Fourier transform. So, so it's exactly what you do. Your basis okay. is for that. Your plus, minus, and so on. It's just a basis for the eigenspaces uh, of the harmonic oscillator. Right. But, you but there is no other example. Of so I see. I see. As simple as that, but uh, okay. not the problem. But <laughs> okay, nice. But yeah, so ultimately, the 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 optimal functions seem to to so in this case for lambda one, for instance, seems yeah. to decay like one over x to the power of four. So it would be better to to sort of live in the cl this class of functions instead, mm -hmm. and the convergence mm -hmm. uh, might be faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, E, for the for the question and comment. Uh, do we have other questions for Maxim? All right. So I think um, we can thank uh, uh, the speaker again, and we will be next week for a talk by uh, Laurent Monk, uh, who will talk about an optimal spectral gap for random compact hyperbolic surfaces.